Hey guys, I want to welcome you to our training session today. Today I'm going to talk about something called the four phases of movement. Now you're thinking, what on earth is that? I'm going to talk about how the church developed at the very beginning and, and how it moved toward what we see today. And I think there's some really insightful things that we can see in these different phases. So the goal of this tool would be for you to gain some insight about where we are today as a church and maybe some things that we could learn or some things that we could develop even further in our skills as a church. So let me just jump right in and start talking about this. The very beginning of the church, and, and even now when missionaries go into a place and they want to see a gospel movement started, they want to see a church planning movement started, what they go into is something that is unreached. There are no churches, there's no gospel witness. This is where the early apostles, right, they found themselves at the very beginning, the book of Acts. And so what do you do when you go in and it's unreached? Well, you just start sowing seed. You just start sharing the gospel. This is the only way to really get this thing going. You've got to get the gospel out there. And so when you're in phase one and it is unreached, you start sowing seed. And then something amazing happens. As we sow seed, God brings believers and those young believers begin to gather into these house churches. Maybe they meet under a tree, or in our day they could meet in a, an apartment clubhouse, not a formal building only for that purpose. So, so these little churches begin to pop up, and they're, they're very simple. And the methods of ministry in this phase are very simple, and they're easily reproducible. Another important part about this phase is that new believers, when someone believes... Um, they are empowered with this idea that they too could lead someone to Christ. They too could learn how to share the gospel and lead someone to Christ. And so we see seed sowing, we see gospel witness, and we see some gatherings of new believers begin to come together. This is what you do when you go into an area that's unreached. And at this point, the, the tools, again, are pretty simple and easily reproducible. The way that they're sharing the gospel. Now, you get into this next part here, and this is where things really begin to take off, and this is movement. And guess what? We still see a lot of seed sowing. We still see a lot of sharing the gospel, and you still see a lot of these churches, right? And so maybe a guy's got a really big living room, right? And so he, he can jam some more people in there, and maybe you're in a place where you get in trouble for preaching the gospel, and so you, you keep your church pretty small, on purpose, so as not to stir things up. And then we also begin to see some buildings that are specifically for that purpose. At the end of this phase, uh, they start to emerge as well. So you still have these house churches, and you have a lot of seed sowing still. Okay, so again, in this phase, every believer is seen as having the gift and the responsibility to multiply. The desire, the responsibility, the gifts to multiply disciples are seen. And so what we have here, and we're going to put a, a P there, this stands for the priesthood of every believer. That means in this phase that every new believer, every believer believes that God has saved them for their own good, for their own heart, for their own soul, and for them to be on mission to continue to reach out to others. So we see the importance of the priesthood of believers here in this phase. Okay, this is a really, really exciting phase. Things are really starting to take off. And all the training that's being done to raise up new believers and to help them make disciples, all that training is being done in context. It's being done in the field. And all the gospel sharing that you see is also out here in the field in the real world, on the streets, in families, in the marketplace. That's where this is happening. So then we move to the next phase where things are beginning to be a little bit more formalized. In this phase, the, the tools and strategies become even a little bit more set. You, you realize what the best practices are, and those are the tools that multiply, and those are the discipleship strategies that you use to raise people up. Now we get into this next phase, and we still see some gospel sharing, and more of the churches are in buildings that are specific for that purpose. 
The, the, like this building that we're in right now. The purpose of this building is for a church to meet. And that's a really great thing. And that's a great blessing. And you still see um, some house churches here. And you still see some seed sowing. Okay. You still see some of this in kind of the early phases of this movement. Um, but then some of these churches get really big. Usually because the leader of that church, the pastor of that church, is a really gifted communicator. So, man, he's, he's passionate about Jesus, and he's preaching the gospel, and uh, maybe he's gotten a lot of training, and maybe now at this point he's been a believer for a number of years. And so, man, people are really flocking to hear this guy preach because he's really gifted. And that's a, again, that's a really good thing. That's great. But what begins to happen, you know, again, you've still got some house churches here. What begins to happen is that now a lot of the seed sowing is taking place inside the buildings. Why? Because if I'm just an ordinary average Christian and I go to church and I hear my pastor share the gospel and man, he can really spin it. Well, now I'm out here and I'm going, I don't need to tell him about Jesus. I'll just bring him out. Let's just let my pastor tell him. He's a professional anyway. And so now here was a lot more of the priesthood of every believer and now it's starting to move toward no, these, these professional pastors, those are the ones who can really share the Word of God. Those are the ones who can really make disciples. Those are the ones who can really evangelize. And so people are bringing people here to hear the gospel. Again, you still get some gospel sharing out here. And so some of these churches get really big. You've got some mega churches. You've got some really strong communicators. And that's what's happening here as things begin to become more formalized. Okay, now here, the next phase is institutional. So now you've really got some big mega churches with big budgets, a lot of resources, and then you've got your training now is less in the context, in the field. Your training now is a lot more institutional. So you've got the emergence of seminaries and the training is sort of taken out of context and into the classroom. This is where the training is happening. And yes, of course, the gospel is still being shared. But again, a lot of that is starting to decline. And so you've kind of got this feel right here. And so things are becoming more institutionalized, of course, in this last phase. Uh, we begin to value attendance over multiplication. Uh, we begin to value how many people we can get at the program over how many people we can get trained to make disciples. And there's a lot of great things still here. There's a lot of resources. There's a lot of buildings. There's a lot of really good things that are specifically designed to minister to Christians, to, to love the church, to care for the church. And so there's some good things here. But what we, what we see is that things have changed. And here becomes a lot more inward focus and so the movement part of the church, the part of the church that's expanding and reaching new people and taking this amazing great love of God and taking it to others, it actually begins to decline. It becomes less of a movement, more of just something that is managed. And so that's what happens in the fourth phase. Okay, so what can we learn from this? As we look at this, what are some things that God might want us to take away from this? What are some insights that God could use in our own lives and in our church? And another great way to, to process this is to ask yourselves, what phase are we in as a church today? As the church in America today, where would we most fit? What does our church most look like? Now, I, I would say, and, and I love, I love our church I'd say that we're probably here in this phase of movement, right? Um, a lot of things are pretty formal, pretty structured, pretty set, pretty standard. And there's a lot of really great things. Man, I'm so thankful for my church. I'm so thankful for the people that minister to me. Some of you minister to me and, I'm so, and, you, and my family. And I'm so thankful. There's so many good things to be grateful for. But, but I, I think we'd have to be honest and say, yeah, we're probably more like this. But then the other question is, but what about the culture around us? 
So our, our church life and our church world probably feels most like this. But what about the surrounding area? What phase is the culture in? Well, we've talked a lot before about how South Florida is 96% unchurched. So culturally, we actually find ourselves in more of this setting. Now, not completely. There's still a lot of church buildings. There's still a, mm, a lot of Christians is pushing it, but not completely. I get it, but we're more like this. So the question is, can we, a church who's sort of used to this, can we do ministry in this context? What would it take for us to leverage great resources and great structures that we have in place that we're really grateful for that God's blessed us with. Like, what would it take to, to leverage these resources for the mission of reaching the unreached? Which is where we are now. So one of the problems that you see um, as, you, as you recognize these four phases is phase four Christians know very little about phase one realities. So if you send someone from a phase four church, who's sort of grown up in this context, into a phase one setting, and there are many of these all around the world, unreached people groups, and, and there's even another category called unengaged unreached people groups, and people are being sent to these. And so what, what happens sometimes though is if you send someone from a phase four church in context into a phase one area, sometimes they don't know what to do. And they try to apply the methods of ministry from this phase to this phase, and it doesn't work. I've heard of people going into areas in, um, you know, developing nations, not westernized at all, Western, westernized Christians that'll go in, and the very first thing they do is build a nice white church building with a big steeple and a white picket fence out in front. It's the first thing they do here and open up and wonder why no one's showing up. Because those are all the methods of ministry that take place here, not here. So, so what would it look like for us? Here we see the apostolic, prophetic, evangelistic gifts really, really emphasized because they're really, really needed because we're unreached. And the further we go, we, we see more of the shepherding and teaching gifts elevated, which are very important gifts, but oftentimes the other gifts unintentionally devalued because everything's sort of already up and running. So how do we leverage the resources that we have here to catapult us back here to reach the 96% unreached that we see in our culture today? Um, that's one of the questions that I really want us asking as a church. That's one of the things that I want us wrestling with. It's one of the things that I want us praying through. So one of the last insights I want to take away from this is here we have sort of this clergy and laity divide. In other words, all the professional ministers are the ones who are seen as um, equipped and with the responsibility to do all the ministry. But here there's less of that divide. Every believer is seen as a minister. Every believer is seen as having the gifts, responsibility, and, and Holy Spirit that they need to be able to do ministry. The ministry of multiplying the gospel and multiplying disciples in a place that's unreached. Because by the way, when you're this unreached, just open up the building and saying, y'all come on in, is not going to do it. We need a movement of multiplying disciples to reach South Florida. And that's what we want to see. So the question we've got to ask and the question we've got to answer is, how do we leverage these resources, where we are now, to put us back in here? And then what are these practices? What are the skills? What are the activities of the church when you're in this sort of phase? And so in the next training video, I want to talk about some of those things. What does it really look like for us to develop a comprehensive skill set to be the church both in here and out there.